a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Stephen D. Krasner, who is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations and Senior Fellow at the Institute for International Studies at Stanford uh, University. Most recently, he has served as Director of Policy Planning at the State Department. And prior to that, he was in government for a year when he helped create the Millennium Challenge Account, an initiative in which acceptance of development aid is contingent upon improved governance of recipient nations. Steve, welcome back to Berkeley. Thanks. Very happy to be here. So for the last couple of years, you've been director at policy planning staff at the State Department. What is that job? What does that unit do? Uh, the unit has had, um, it's a unit of about 15 people. Uh, they are a mix of foreign service officers, permanent civil servants, and outside experts. The most famous director, of course, and the founding director of the policy planning staff was George Kennan. Every successor has attempted to replicate <laughs> Kennan's success in developing grand strategies. Uh, certainly none have been as successful as he was. Uh, but basically, what po policy planning does a number of different things. It's an in-house think tank in the State Department. Uh, it can send, write memos and send them directly to the secretary without clearing them with other bureaus, which in the bureaucracy is a powerful uh, status to have. Uh, it can work on special projects. So when I was there, we worked on foreign assistance reform and a new initiative called the Partnership for Democratic Governance. Uh, and it also tries to keep tabs on the individual bureaus. So, so staff members within policy planning are assigned to clear on papers that come from individual bureaus in the State Department. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about that, that unit's history, uh, Kennan, uh, uh, in addition to being the most famous holder of that position, really helped uh, and gave us a grand strategy for that whole Cold War period. Correct. I'm now. Admittedly, he developed a grand strategy before he became director of policy planning when he was still in Moscow and wrote the long telegram. Um, and if we were smart enough, perhaps we would have been able to come up with a grand strategy for this period, but we didn't succeed in doing that. But, but it's a very different world, isn't it? I mean, he, that world, uh, and I'll ask you to, to distinguish that world from today's world. It, it, it seemed to be uh, state-centric in a much more powerful way. I think that's correct, but I think the kind of challenge that Kennan faced isn't so different than the challenge that we're looking at today. Uh, true containment, when Kennan wrote the long telegram, um, and then the famous Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs, it was at a period when American foreign policy wasn't settled and it wasn't obvious what our relations would be with the Soviet Union. Uh, although it was already becoming apparent in 46 and certainly into then into 47 that it was going to be difficult for the United States to work cooperatively, cooperatively with the Soviet Union. So when Kennan developed, I mean, this idea of, of containment as a grand strategy, it did reflect the fact that there was, we'd already been in, engaged in containment at the point at which it was accepted mm. as, a, as, a, as a strategy. Um, and it then helped to codify and solidify and suggest other avenues of policy. I think the challenge today is, as you said, I mean, it's not just that the world was state-centric then and we're dealing with different kinds of actors in the contemporary world, but I think the bigger issue is not just that in terms of why we don't have a grand strategy now. Um, I think the bigger challenge is we don't have a consensus about what the nature of the environment actually is. Mm -hmm. and what the level of threat is, how serious it is, if we're thinking, for instance, about transnational terrorism. And there's tremendous variation um, in what people think the reality is that we're confronting in the contemporary period. And that's why I think we don't have a grand strategy. Mm -hmm. And, and why, uh, why that difference? Is it that, that in the containment period, the political leaders did a better job 
of building a consensus or it was easier to build a consensus or what? I don't think so. I think it was a, the fact that it wasn't as if we finished with the Second World War. We looked at the Soviet Union after VJ Day on August 15, 1945, and said, oh, gee, um, this is a bipolar world, and we're going to need a policy to deal with the Soviet Union. As you know, I mean, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until mid-1947 that you actually settled on this policy of containment. And that happened after the Soviets had taken a number of steps in Eastern Europe, which made it apparent to American political leaders that, that hope that some had, certainly Roosevelt, for instance, that we would be able to have a cooperative policy with Stalin, that that hope was not going to be realized. I think the problem, if you look at the contemporary period, is this. I mean, we have this large security challenge that we know. Transnational terrorism, weapons of mass destruction. Well, what's the chance of another 9-11 or more than 9-11 attack taking place in the next five years? Vanishingly small, 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%? Mm -hmm. There isn't really a good way to get that estimate. And making choices then about how you're going to deal with that threat when you don't exactly know what, how serious it is, is I think the major impediment. So I don't think it's the fact that the environment is more complicated, or only the fact that the environment is more complicated, which it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's also the fact that there's disagreement about what the nature of the environment is. So just as it took two and a half years, I would say, from the end of the Second World War, um, or, Less, I mean, you altered to the, you know, to developing this policy of containment, and then longer to actually codify it in SC 68, which was even later. Um, it isn't surprising to me that it's taking a while to figure out what our situation is now. But the irony is now, of course, in some ways, we still don't have a good fix on what would fix this world. Well, if, if we don't have more mega terrorist attacks, uh, does that mean the world is safe, or that we have to continue to be vigilant? Mm -hmm. um, if we had a number of mega terrorist attacks, then I think things would be clarified in ways that would be very unpleasant, but in ways that would certainly end the ambiguity that we're that we that we're suffering from now. Uh, in, in your work as an IR specialist, before you took this position, you you had you had uh, uh, focused, in, especially in your recent books, on this whole question of sovereignty, and in a in a previous. A period in your career, you had focused on the politics of uh, natural resources and and uh, in the international economy and the interface with with state power. Did that work kind of help you clarify the kinds of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, papers that you wanted to commission or, or the thinking, or did you put that aside and you were really focused on what uh, you know the policy? Uh, uh, community was demanding at the present time? Um, Kissinger, I think, famously said that whatever intellectual capital you have when you get into government is all you're going to have. You're not going to be able to replenish it while you're in Washington. Mm -hmm. That's certainly very true, but it, it is the case that a lot of the academic work that I've been engaged in, um, especially over the last decade, I mean, proved to be very relevant. I mean, it was work about the nature of sovereignty. And my major conclusion from this academic work was that conventional ideas of sovereignty had frequently been violated. And this idea of non-intervention was often honored in the breach. So if you think about the big challenge of the contemporary period, which is how do we influence domestic authority structures in other states, rather than conventional state-to-state -state relations, my academic work actually proved to be relevant in a broad sense. I mean, it didn't provide specific answers, but at least it showed me that it, it helped to define the nature of the problem for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you, I mean, one specific instance where it was very directly relevant. When I first arrived at the State Department, Secretary Rice uh, was talking about the idea of transformational diplomacy. Um, and she gave a speech, actually, a year later in January, I think, of, of 2006 at Georgetown about this, which attracted real attention in the foreign policy community. Uh, but shortly after I arrived, she asked me to write a memo about transformational diplomacy, sort of defining what it meant. And it was actually very easy, given the work that I had done, mm -hmm. to say, OK, conventional diplomacy is about state-to-state -state relations. Transformational diplomacy is about influencing domestic authority structures in other states. Um, and I mean, someone else could have written the memo, but it, certainly my academic background there was useful.
Mm -hmm. And and so help us understand. Let's get into this threat that that we're talking about. In other words, that very weak states, states that have failed, uh, 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 can either on their own or by spawning terrorist organization pose a threat to uh, the great powers in totally unexpected ways. Is, is that the big, the big problem? Yeah, and this is a, it is the big problem, and it is a, a unique problem in international relations. Uh, if you look at international politics in the past, I mean, basically, it was about state-to-state -state relations, and more than that, it was about relations among major powers. Uh, and if there was going to be a war, it was going to be a war between Germany and France. It was not a war between Liechtenstein and, and <laughs> France, or even Liechtenstein and Austria, or, or Switzerland, for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so that you had a situation in which, in some ways, underlying capabilities, which you could measure, say, by GNP or population or some, some such measure, were very good indicators of a state's ability or an actor's ability to do harm. Mm -hmm. There have been transnational terrorist groups in the past. Um, anarchists killed half a dozen political leaders, including the president of the United States, around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but if you looked at the harm that they could do, I mean, you could throw, and they did, throw a stick of dynamite into a crowded theater. Or you might be able to kill 20 people or 50 people. Uh, you were not in a position where you could kill thousands or even tens of thousands of people. Uh, if you look at the contemporary situation, you have North Korea, I mean, would be an example of this, a kind of not a failed state, but a hard but weak state, um, has some small fraction of the GNP of Japan, its neighbors, Japan, China, Russia. We don't even know what the GNP is because nobody really has collected data, but I think it would be fair to say it's probably one half of one percent, the GNP of those countries. You know, we are reasonably sure that they have nuclear weapons, and we know that they have missiles that could reach major cities in Japan. So you're in a situation in which a very weak state in terms of underlying capabilities can do very, potentially do very, rec very, very serious harm on, on states that are really major powers. And that is a major change. And it's nuclear weapons, the availability of chemical weapons probably a little less troubling. Um, biological weapons, I mean, still tricky, but you know, you can't quite cook it up in your bathtub, um, but still surely something that will be available um, at some point in time, or surely we can't write off the possibility of that. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, this situation of relatively weak actors, whether state actors or non-state actors, having access to weapons that could kill many, many people, I mean, even, you know, not to be hyperbolic, but even millions of people, that is a unique development historically. Mm -hmm. So, so the the uh, sequence of events after 9/11 uh, can partly be explained by the 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 pressures that the leaders felt uh, in response to that event, and in other words, it it sort of uh, elevated their consciousness. Uh, uh, to the tenth power or more uh, with regard to what was a theoretical possibility before. Yeah, I mean, we have to recognize it wasn't a theoretical possibility. I yeah. mean, if you start with Beirut um, mm -hmm. in 1983, the coal, the embassy bombings, the World Trade Center mm -hmm. bombing in 1993, it wasn't a theoretical possibility, but it absolutely wasn't something, as you said, that people had focused on mm -hmm. um, and seen as the primary concern of American foreign policy. I don't think this is so unusual. That mm -hmm. is surprising events. I mean, if you, how many people in, in August of 1914, I mean, thought that World War I was going to kill tens of millions of people? Well, some, but not very many. You know, how many people in, let's say, 1928 would have said that Hitler was going to come to power and, mm -hmm. you know, not only start the Second World War, but Know, killed six million Jews in the continent of Europe. Now, how many people would have said in 1988 that Central Europe, said, said the countries of Central Europe would be democratic countries um, and even liberal democratic countries a decade later? So I think international relations, we have to recognize, is filled with surprises, even over the last hundred years or so.
Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, 9-11 wasn't a, I mean, it was a continuation of events that had happened, uh, of other events, and, and even had been signaled by this effort to blow up the World Trade Center in 1993. But it was only the shock of something as successful as 9-11 from the point of terrorists that I think you know, clearly that focused the attention of decision makers. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a recent paper that you did, uh, uh, you point out uh, in one of your tables that between uh, 37 and 73 countries can be classified as pre-modern political entities in which there is limited domestic political authority and governance. So, so that, that, that there, is a, there are actors out there who could be either in their own policies or in supporting groups within their domain or abroad could, could actually spawn these, these kind of uh, threats that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, clearly what's happened, I mean, in a long, kind of longer historical sweep is this. I mean, you have this idea of sovereignty develops in Europe over a long period of time, has these attributes where sovereign states are treated as equal. Each state is as understood to be capable of governing within its own territory. You have this principle or norm of non-intervention very clearly recognized, although, as I said, frequently violated. So you had, you had this set of principles which developed in Europe over several hundred years, um, you know, beginning really, I mean, in the, in the 16th century and kind of in some ways not being really fully codified even until the 19th or even the 20th century. The United States, for instance, did not except the principle of non-intervention formally until 1933. You then have, after the Second World War, and especially in the period around 1960, decolonization, um, in which the European powers gave up their colonial empires. And the question was, you, cre you created then a whole series of new entities which were defined how? As sovereign states, because it was the only institutional form that was available. Um, I'm reading, if I get a very interesting book now about the, the first formal British delegation to Beijing, to Beijing in 1792-93, mm -hmm. this book called The Collision of Civilizations. But it's clear, I mean, the Chinese had a view of the world, which was what? China was the center of the world. You can look back on the Chinese imperial records, and every visit to China was described as a vassal paying homage to the emperor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The British wanted to establish a set of symmetrical relations, taking this European idea of symmetry and sovereignty, um, which they didn't succeed in doing then and only succeeded in doing after fighting the Opium Wars and, and other things. So I think the issue here is you had a, an available institutional form, sovereignty developed in Europe, which gets plopped down in many other parts of the mm -hmm. world where one would have to ask, was this really appropriate? But it was the only institutional form available. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you have now significant numbers of badly governed states, I mean, is you don't really have this kind of world of ideal sovereign states. You have a lot of states that are governed very well and also quite a substantial number that are governed very badly. You, you use the term in, in, in your work, uh, a term you borrowed from sociology, organized hypocrisy, because people don't want uh, uh, the... the, the the international community don't want to recognize these realities that you're talking about now. Yeah, I think the key of organized hypocrisy is this, that you frequently have situations in which you have a norm or a rule, and this, the rule here is non-intervention. Uh, the rule is clearly recognized. It's accepted. People don't argue with it, and yet it's frequently violated. Now, normally, I think if you're a kind of rationalist, normal political scientist or economist, you would think if you have a rule that's frequently violated, the rule would be changed. Mm -hmm. um, or at least it would be regarded as utterly sinful to violate it. I mean, what you find in this situation of organized hypocrisy, I think, is that you have a rule which is frequently violated, but there actually is no better alternative. So no one is out there shouting and saying, look, let's get rid of sovereignty. Let's do something else, like reestablish colonialism or establish trusteeships, um, because weaker states don't want that, because they themselves would then be the targets of those activities. And I think stronger states don't want such alternatives either, because they might be obligated to engage in places where they're not anxious to be engaged. Mm -hmm. So given the complexity of the environment, I would say it's not surprising that you don't have a perfect rule or set mm -hmm. of rules. Uh, but in that situation, we ought not to be surprised about organized hypocrisy. Happens all the time. It seems like the, the problems that we're talking about uh, uh, for an IR specialist uh, 
uh, are the point of interface between the people who think globalization is changing everything, that, that we're beyond the nation state on the one hand, and then people who, who uh, believe in the enduring reality of the state system. And that I as we address these problems, we're, we're having to confront this, this confrontation. Is that fair? I think, it, I, I think these, these issues are related, but don't exactly map on each other perfectly. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, at least my position on globalization would be, you know, globalization, a precondition for global, globalization is effective governance. Who are the most globalized political or economic entities? Well, they're the major states in the world where you do have effective governance. Um, it isn't necessarily perfect. I mean, I wouldn't say India is governed as well as Sweden, say. But where you do have enough effective governance so that you can actually have economic activities that operate, contracts that are honored more or less all of the time, you can have a reasonably stable exchange rate. So without effective domestic governance, it's very difficult to see that you would have globalization. And if you look at mm. growth rates, I mean, economic growth rates and, and rates of international exchange over the last 40 years, Contra what a kind of simple economic model would suggest, which would, is that you'd get more trade where you have countries that are very unlike each other. In fact, what you've got in, is more trade in countries that are like each other, major, you know, the US, Japan, Europe, and now increasingly, I mean, China and, and India, which are more consistent with conventional notions of international trade, but where has trade grown the most slowly in Africa? Mm -hmm. um, so, in that sense, poor governance um, really would preclude globalization because globalization requires some kind of stability within the entity within which you're producing the good or service. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the notions that emerge, say, from the European community of moving beyond uh, the nation state, that is, uh, that in, in, in creating, you know, one market and one European Union is, is uh, not, uh, 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 cannot be copied in other parts of the world because it's a unique set of circumstances that have created that possibility yeah, there. I, mean, I think the European Union is really a new, new thing. Um, and it is some, it's an entity that has moved beyond conventional notions of sovereignty. So the Europeans have created these supranational institutions, the European Court of Justice, uh, the uh, European Bank, the European Central Bank, which are exceptionally powerful and which now dominate what we would normally think of as decisions within national states. So the European Court of Justice rulings have supremacy over national law and direct effect in the domestic judicial systems of member states. And if you're in a country which has accepted the euro, I mean, you've basically given up, not basically, you've given up your control over monetary, national control over monetary policy. So I think the European Union, in terms of both the supranational institutions and also the fact that they have qualified majority voting on a number of major issues, that is a fundamental change. And the European Union is different. It's not a conventional international organization, and it's not simply now a federal state like the United States. But I think it is what developed in Europe is, I think, not likely to be replicated elsewhere, I think, for two reasons. One, initially, um, American support for the European Union was extremely important and was a reflection of the Cold War. I mean, you would, your normal expectation would have been the United States wins the Second World War. It has all these potential rivals out there in, in Europe would have engaged in a divide and conquer strategy. It didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And it didn't do that, at least in part, because of the threat from the Soviet Union. So the Americans were very supportive of European integration, A, and B, um, created a security umbrella which took security issues off the table for the Europeans. So I think that was very critical in Europe. And second, and I think more important, was that the largest country in Europe, Germany, mm -hmm. was anxious to tie its own hands, to embed itself in Europe, and to limit its own freedom of action. And I think that reflected two things. One. The Germans had basically initiated two world wars, and they had lost. And the problem for Germany is too big, but not big enough. That's a classic argument. I mean, too big in the sense that it was always a threat to the other European powers, not big enough in the sense that it was never able to dominate Europe in the way that the United States, for mm -hmm. instance, can dominate North America. And secondly, the Nazi experience for Germans was incredibly sobering. And if you wanted, I believe, I mean, this is a view that I don't have empirical evidence to substantiate, 
that if you want to capture a sense of pride, I mean, it's very difficult, I mean, to, to kind of rekindle anything like conventional German nationalism. Uh, but you could certainly rekindle pride in being a European. So I think the support of the United States and the American security umbrella and the fact that the largest country in Europe was very supportive of integration, uh, create, we're, those were conditions which are not going to be replicated elsewhere. So I, while I think the European Union really is a new, new thing, I don't think it will be mimicked in other parts of the world. Now, uh, the, this problem that we're dealing with and that you had to deal with at policy planning uh, seems to be uh, divisible in, into two parts. One is the threat, which you talked about, uh, uh, and uh, sort of identifying that threat uh, and acting on it. And we're in a world where uh, America has more military power than all the other countries uh, combined. So it, it would seem that uh, the, the, the set of problems for America is unique uh, in the first instance if there is an imminent threat because we have to say, well, okay, what do we know about this situation? Is it about to happen and how do we respond? And that really goes back to the, the, the state-centric notion, namely we're the one with the most power and we have all the options if we feel there's a threat and we have to act. Yeah, I think though it's not, the threat obviously is not only a threat uh, which the United States confronts, mm -hmm. you know, and so if we look at Spain and Britain, I mean, which have suffered from major attacks, um, we know that this is something that also could possibly occur in Europe. The problem, though, is then what do you, how do you think about addressing that mm -hmm. issue? And I, I actually just heard, driving over here from Stanford, you know, a statement by Gordon Brown um, on, um, uh, I think it was Brown, not another British official, talking about terrorists as criminals. And the British position, I mean, has consistently been, you should, you should talk about them as criminals. Um, it delegitimates them. And the Americans, the U.S. made a mistake by thinking about, by using this notion of the war on terror um, and using war terminology to de describe the opponent. So the issue here is, again, it's an example of the fact that we don't have agreement on what the nature of the problem is and how we should address it. But I think in, in a larger sense, if you, yes, it's true that the United States has this enormous amount of military capability. But the kind of standard view now would be if you're thinking certainly about terrorism, it requires a very, very wide range of capacities, and intelligence sharing, conventional policing, um, the judicial system, lots of things. Um, and even if you're thinking about post-conflict environments, if you're looking at Afghanistan or Iraq, um, the general consensus would be, or you're thinking about counterinsurgency activity, that it's at least as much civilian as military, and probably more civilian than military. And in this sense, the kind of mix of resources that we have within the United States now isn't aligned with what the demands are on our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. We've got, I mean, the budget for the Department of Defense is about $600 billion, $600 plus billion. Uh, the budget for the State Department and USAID is about $40 billion. Um, if you look at counterinsurgency doctrine, I mean, it would say that the civilian military mix is 80-20, and we're in a situation in which our allocation of resources um, is, you know, kind of 90-10 military civilian. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, why is that? Is it just the inertia of the military uh, budgets? Is it the choices that were made going back to the Clinton administration and the and and the first Bush administration and the end of the Cold War, namely keeping the uh, uh, the military uh, budgets uh, very high in relation to uh, the other resources we might deploy? Yeah. I think it's way beyond that. I mean, I think it's the basic structure in the way in which the government is organized. The government, not just our government, but other governments as well, are basically organized to deal with state-to-state -state relations. We mm. have militaries that fight wars with other states. Uh, we have state departments that deal with other foreign ministries. Now, transformational diplomacy was an effort to kind of reconfigure that. Um, we have an aid agency which is engaged in trying to support economic and political development. 
but whose budget was severely cut and personnel was severely cut during the 1990s because end of the Cold War, the question was, why were we mm -hmm. doing this? Um, I mean, the Bush administration has actually tripled foreign aid, so it's increased it very substantially. But it's certainly the, even AID is not ideally aligned to deal with the kinds of issues that we're addressing now. So if, if you said right now we could kind of start from scratch, which we can't, and you asked yourself what kind mm -hmm. of bureaucratic entity you would want to create, you'd want to create something that combines state AID and the Department of Defense. That's what you would want. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd certainly want something like a gendarmerie, mm -hmm. you know, a heavily armed police force, which we don't have. You'd want a kind of militarized AID to some extent. Um, you'd want a military that had, a, and the military is now using anthropologists as advisors, I know, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. You'd want a military that was very sensitive uh, to the local environment. But the world, you can't start the world from scratch. But mm -hmm. I think the issues that we're dealing with here are not ones that were simply the result of choices that were made by the Clinton administration or the Bush administration in terms of resource allocation. They really reflect a, a, a long, the basic organizational design of the U.S. government and other governments as well. So, so it, it, an initiative towards uh, uh, transformative diplomacy would be looking at both uh, working with states that are not yet there in terms of becoming a threat, but are really a spawning ground, and working with them to create maybe institutional forms of government within their boundaries that it would involve other actors that would keep them from uh, uh, fulfilling this worst case scenario. Right. I mean, let me say first, I mean, if you look at transnational terrorism, it's not just the result of failed states. Mm -hmm. um, it's the result of lots of other things, alienation of individuals. I mean, look at this kid from Riverside, mm -hmm. who's the chief spokesman for Al Qaeda now, grows up in Riverside County, hippie parents. Um, I think his grandfather was actually a Jewish doctor in Los Angeles, ends up now being the chief spokesman for Al Qaeda. Well, that's not a failed state story, it's something mm -hmm. else. Uh, or the bombers in, in Britain who, I mean, were British citizens. So it's not just um, a question of failed or badly governed states, but it's certainly partly that. Mm -hmm. uh, so ideally, I mean, what you want is a, you want, if, if you're looking at transformational diplomacy, it's exactly, as you said, the idea was that a lot of what the State Department needs to do um, is to look at, I mean, how can you support the development of political parties, civil society? Um, can you help in ways that might make government somewhat less corrupt? Um, are there ways that you can do this, I mean, as well as carrying out conventional diplomacy? The challenge, though, is, I mean, that's not the way in which, um, it's not traditionally what the State Department has done. Now, it is what a lot of people in the State Department have done since 1990. If you talk to people that were in Central Europe or the former Soviet Union, they have been engaged in transformational diplomacy. So it wasn't that the professional foreign service rejected or was resistant to this idea. But it does mean that you have to think about different career trajectories for people. You have to think about training people differently. And here, and this is, I mean, it's been in the news for the last couple of days, the State Department is now um, going to have mandatory assignment of foreign service officers to Iraq. The Secretary of State has, has the authority to do that. It's very clear to me that the State Department, including Secretary Rice, have been very resistant and reluctant to do that um, and have relied on incentives to try and get people to go to Iraq. Well, it's very different. I mean, if you look at the military, in the military, if you're told to go someplace, you go. That's part of your job. That is not conventionally what happened in the State Department. So do you want to think about, and maybe we do want to think about, a State Department in which mandatory assignment to post is considered part of the job? Mm -hmm. That's different than the way in which the State Department has been organized and thought about itself in the past, and it's why these things are big challenges. A few years ago, we had uh, James Dobbins on this program, and uh, uh, in, in reading his papers uh, one, and, and his speeches, there was a sense of, in the 90s, a reluctance to make an institutional commitment by the American government uh, to, to do the kind of uh, uh, activities that we're talking about, either pre-threat or post-intervention. 
uh, and uh, partly having to do with uh, America's conception of itself and its role in the world. Do you see that as, as a continuing problem, or will Iraq have taught us lessons about making the kind of institutional and career commitment that you're talking about? Uh, all right. My guess, and this is a bet, guess and a bet, would be mm -hmm. that Iraq is going to lead to a real reassessment of how we do these things. And there are already a number of um, commissions, not government commissions, but not you know, uh, private commissions that are looking exactly at this relationship between civilian and military capacity. Um, Dobbins isn't wrong, uh, in, and he's thought about these issues seriously and has done really excellent work. But the question would have been this. In the 1990s, why should we bother? How the, okay, these places are falling apart. That's a sad and unfortunate thing. Um, and there were some things that were extremely tragic. If you look at Rwanda, for instance, I mean, which was an agonizing issue. I know for some people that were on the National Security Council staff at the time. But if you asked, how is this related to American interests, wasn't so easy to make that hmm. connection. That's the first thing. Second thing is that this stuff is damn hard. We don't know how to do it well. Um, actually, a lot of Dobbins' work has been very, very helpful in suggesting the parameters that you need to, that you need if you're going to be successful in state building. But this stuff is very hard. If you look at foreign assistance, for instance, there is some maybe weak evidence that it's had a positive impact. But there are now a number of major academics that are arguing that foreign assistance has actually been negative. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in an environment in which we have this large challenge. There are no formulaic ways to do it. We're not organized to do it very well. And nor do we have a very terrific track record. It's not that our track record has been failed. And if you look at actually the Caribbean and Central America, the U.S. was quite successful in the 90s in promoting democratic regimes, sometimes by force, as in Panama. But overall, we have no formulaic ways of doing this, and we haven't organized ourselves very well to do it. And, and so what, what are strategies for creating these institutional forms that will be new, uh, where you have both outside and inside participation. Yeah, I think this is going to, this is a big, hard problem, and something if, you know, people do look back at Iraq and Afghanistan and say, you know, wow, you know, these were, these were hard problems, um, regardless of what we think about the merits of going in, and certainly people would have thought, you know, think that we should have gone in in Afghanistan. Um, the question is, once we're there, what do we do? I think there are no easy answers to this. So I'll give you some possibilities. Um, one thing that I worked on at, uh, when I was at the State Department was greater integration of foreign assistance across state and AID. Um, AID, the administrator of AID, formally reports to the Secretary of State and is formally subordinate to the Secretary of State. But in practice, before this reform was instituted by Secretary Rice, there wasn't really very much coordination between state and AID. There are 19 separate accounts in, this, in state and AID itself, foreign assistance accounts. And what, um, what Secretary Rice decided to do was to create a new position called the Director of Foreign Assistance, who would have not just formal authority over the accounts, but actual de facto authority over all of these accounts. So one thing you can do. But this is relatively modest and could be done by the Secretary of State on her own authority, um, because she had the existing authority to do it, is to integrate state and AID. All right, should you think about other foreign assistance programs, there are something like 20 U.S. government entities which have foreign mm -hmm. assistance programs. The Department of Defense has a foreign assistance program which is probably 10 or 20 percent of total foreign assistance. Should you try and bring that more formally under the control of the Secretary of State? Treasury Department, Agriculture Department, all of these have um, Health and Human Services, all have foreign assistance kinds of activities. All right, that would be more ambitious. So that's one possibility. Um, try and bring these other programs under the purview of the State Department. A second possibility would be to create a cabinet level agency um, which would be in charge of these kinds of activities, kind of reconstruction and assistance and development. Um, in which you take these activities from different entities and actually put them in a new political entity. A third possibility is that you try and get greater coordination within the existing system. In my view, that's extremely challenging and difficult to do.
And a fourth possibility is you mm. say, okay, you know, the military is really the only entity in the American government that's capable of doing this. So we're going to systematically increase the scope of activity and the range of activity that's under the authority of the military. But you can see that all of these choices, putting this more directly under the State Department, new cabinet level agency, interagency coordination, enhancing the role of DOD, all of these choices are hard. Uh, you mentioned the, the, uh, a leading role for the military several times. Are, are there kind of uh, negative implications to that? I mean, they're efficient and they can do the job, but, but uh, uh, would, would we then make choices that, that might yeah. skew the, this effort? Sure, and it's kind of obvious. I mean, what yeah. the problem is. I mean, the problem is, I mean, the military is not, and DOD, are, they're not engaged in diplomacy. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily going to be sensitive to the range of interests and diplomatic issues that um, are the concern of the State Department and other agencies within the U.S. government. So yes, it's not, this is for, would be far from a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. And I think the military would say that as well. I mean, my guess is that, and I'm guessing here, I mean, if you ask most military officers would prefer to keep the military focused on its primary missions rather than trying to expand its missions in ways that will be very difficult for won't be easy for the military to accommodate, even though they have accommodated many of these things. In, in your paper, you, you pose the choice between uh, uh, multilateral solutions versus unilateral solutions uh, in the case of intervening uh, uh, and the, the effort to develop uh, new institutional uh, forms. So the, and you also say at one point that if we're going to begin intervening in the affairs of what we have called sovereign entities in the past, that legitimacy is going to be very important, legitimating the process uh, uh, that we're undertaking. Uh, talk a little about that. I mean, does multilateralism make it easier to legitimate what we're trying to do here, or will it always be perceived as illegitimate because of, of the rules of organized hypocrisy. Yeah, I think that, first of all, we're not beginning to do this. I mean, this is something, efforts to, to influence authority structures in other states have been an enduring mm -hmm. uh, characteristic of what we've called the sovereign state system. Um, there's a, a very interesting paper by John Owen, who teaches at the University of Virginia, who's identified hundreds of incidents like this, I mean, going back to the 17th century. So it's, this is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's an old thing. The question, though, is if you're doing it, I mean, issues of legitimacy and capacity are critical. Having a consensus on what you should be doing is absolutely useful. Um, so that if you could do this in a multilateral way, that's something that's very advantageous. I mean, one of the things that I worked on in government is a, a new initiative called the Partnership for Democratic Governance. And the basic idea of this initiative uh, is to try and make it, e if, the, if you have countries with limited capacity, to try and make it easier for them to contract out govern government services for a limited period of time and to use independent service providers rather than relying on the government when the government might not have capacity. And in pursuing this initiative, we were extremely anxious to make this multilateral, and we've actually it's come to fruition in the form of a small advisory group at the OECD in Paris, which is designed to advise countries that want to engage in this kind of activity. But we were extremely happy from an American perspective that we got support from Chile, Brazil, Organization of American States, um, as well as some European countries, Poland, Denmark, um, Korea, Japan. And we saw from the beginning that pursuing this idea in a in a unilateral way wasn't going to work, and that pursuing it in a multilateral way, because it did lend legitimacy to this, would make it much more likely that it would be successful. And we also, in pursuing this idea, have done this not only with the OECD, but basically this idea has been taken by the OECD, which is now partnering with the United Nations Development Program. So yeah, legitimacy is important. And can, can you help us uh, see a scenario where one might have to come up with a new organizational form uh, and uh, intervene because of threats to, for example, the, the global energy market, basically, because of the deterioration uh, in, in a particular 
uh, uh, important oil producing yeah. state? I mean, I think if you, you're likely to get new institutional forms only if something really quite disastrous happens. Uh, but let's say that, um, take a major oil exporting state in the Middle East, um, taken over, the government's taken over by radical Islamists who decide that they're simply going to cut exports. Now, usually, you wouldn't expect that to happen because these countries are getting billions of dollars. But if you think you're going to save your soul or create heaven on earth, you might decide that it's the right thing to do. Um, under those circumstances, if this was, if such a cutoff were suddenly, sudden and significant, uh, you would then be confronted with a situation where you could have major, major economic downturns. I mean, much more severe than what we had in the 1970s when oil prices quadrupled around the world. Um, and you would have a situation in which you have this resource which external actors would have the capability of actually taking over. Now, this would be messy and you would have to fight. Mm -hmm. But under those circumstances, I can imagine um, scenarios which are now in some ways unthinkable. So you might declare the oil resources of the Persian Gulf as part of the common heritage of mankind. Uh, you might say that instead of simply saying that if the stuff's under your own territory, it's yours, uh, you might say, no, subsoil rights, sovereignty doesn't lend itself automatically to subsoil rights if your government, governance is ineffective. Uh, so we'll create some kind of international e entity to run this energy supply. Um, we'll take the resources and revenue, for instance, and give it to the World Bank so they could use it for development, would be a very nice way of getting buy-in. Um, and you would create then a situation which is very, very different in ter than what these conventional sovereignty rules. I don't think those kinds of very dramatic things would happen. You know, oil declared as part of the common heritage of mankind, absent very bad things happening first. But if very bad things do happen, and they could happen, I think you could see some very dramatic rewriting of the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, one has to step back and say it's a little odd to say that we're giving billions and billions of dollars to countries just because they happen to have this resource on their territory. They didn't really do anything to develop it. Um, it's essentially rent. You're just sitting back and collecting the money. Um, outside actors do have the military capacity, actually, to take this over, should they want to. Um, the rules of sovereignty have kind of inhibited this from happening, and people see that violating the rules would be messy. But if you really had a dramatic and catastrophic event, um, I think you could see the rules being rewritten in very substantial ways. And would, uh, if we look back at the lessons of Iraq in that possible future scenario uh, uh, where you get intervention, it, it seems like it's going to be very important to legitimate uh, the initial intervention uh, uh, with broad-based support on the one hand, but secondly, developing a way to hand off responsibilities, you know, once you have the initial military action. I don't think the initial legitimation is so critical. I think mm -hmm. that the issue in Iraq was not the failure to get initial legitimation, but the fact that Iraq has been extremely messy, obviously mm -hmm. way more difficult and problematic um, than the administration imagined when it first in occupied and invaded Iraq. So I think the question is what you need to do is get good outcomes. I think that's a critical thing, and I think mm -hmm. the rules the rules will follow from the actual, from facts on the ground and outcomes, rather than determining the outcomes in some absolute and definitive way. So I think the critical issue is if you're, if you're going to intervene, first of all, it's certainly useful to be multilateral rather than not be multilateral. But it's absolutely critical to have the capacity, if you do intervene, um, to see what phase four will be. I mean, how are you going to engage in post-conflict reconstruction? Recognize that you, you need commitments over an extended period of time. I and mean, Dobbins, for instance, in his work has said, no successful, modern, no successful democratization without having at least five years of very heavy external engagement. So you have to recognize that if you're going to go in, it's going to be long term and it's going to be expensive. And I think that's a critical thing, as critical, in fact, more critical than the multilateral element of this. Mm -hmm. And how do you, in this country, build domestic support for that? Is that uh, something that's going to be a, a real uh, hornet's nest? Um, I think it's a real challenge for this reason. I mean, the amounts that would be involved if you're looking at engagement, it's not that we couldn't afford this. Mm 
You know, I think our defense expenditures now are 3 or 4% during the Cold War, they were 10%. I mean, during the Second World War, they were nearly 50%. Um, it's not that we don't have the resources to do it. The question is, how do you mo mobilize popular support? And here the irony is this. The more successful we are in preventing mega-terrorist attacks, the less political support you'll have hmm. for, in for ambitious engagement. Now, I don't think that, or it, at least that would be what you would normally expect. I think that presidential leadership could really matter in this situation. It's not something where you can't actually rally support. It's not an unmanageable level of, of resource commitment for the United States. But it will be hard if we're successful. If we're unsuccessful and you do have more mega terrorist attacks, it will be a lot less difficult to get these resources. The last time I interviewed you and asked you about what you learned in Washington that wasn't in your theory and books, uh, your stay had been much shorter. Now your stay has been uh, longer. And, and I'm curious if, uh, if there were any new lessons uh, for you this time around. Um, I don't know whether the lesson is new, but here's something I, I did learn, or at least it's something wh which has greater clarity for me now than it did after my first day in Washington. Making policy is extremely different than doing academic work. That's something I did recognize. But the critical thing in policy is often the strength of framing ideas. It's not analysis in the way that political scientists do analysis, where you're trying to explain events in the past with more or less full information. Ideally, and it sort of circles back to where we started, if you're thinking about grand strategy, but it's not just grand strategies, but other strategies as well, what you're looking for are framing ideas that can guide policy, that have heuristic punch and power. I mean, containment is everybody's favorite example of this. Um, but transformational diplomacy is another example of this. I mean, it is, is an idea that captures something about what the State Department should be doing now. And it says a lot about, for instance, should you have mandatory assignments or not? What mm. kind of training should you do at the Foreign Service Institute? How, what, where should you be posting your foreign service officers uh, to Europe or, or to um, parts of the developing world and in what numbers. So these framing ideas are extremely important um, in terms of making foreign policy work because they both suggest what you should do, they legitimate what you should do, and they gather support for what you should be doing. And, and what is the, the key to having a formula that gathers support? Does it, does it have to resonate in the uh, political culture? Does it have to... Uh, uh, draw political allies across the government? What, what is the dynamic here? Yeah, good question, and I don't have a perfect <laughs> answer to this. I mean, I would say all of the above. It has, to, it, it has to, I think, codify what people are already doing, for one thing. And in that sense, it, um, so it articulates what was already there implicitly. Um, and in saying that, it, it has to be something which conforms with reality, not perfectly, and maybe not the only conceptualization mm -hmm. that would conform with reality. But it has to capture reality, and it is also clear to me that it does have to be, it has to have heuristic power, by which I mean the idea has to suggest things to do in a wide range of areas um, so that people, since you can't always be calling back to Washington, it has to provide guidance which is, which is specific enough so that people can associate what they're doing with that broad idea. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're back at Stanford now, and so I, I want to pose a hypothetical, which is if, if you were designing a, a, uh, an academic program for students who envision uh, uh, going into the policy realm, uh, do you have any new thoughts about that based on your work? And, and I want to add a, a, a footnote here, which is that, you know, if you look at Kennan, basically, one of the important things is he really knew Russia uh, as, a, I guess we would call him an area specialist and a historian in that sense. So, so what, what, what thoughts and reflections do you have either about new curriculum or if no new curriculum develops about uh, how uh, students should think about preparing for their future? All right, if you're kind enough to invite me back again, I am going to teach a course on public policy this spring, <laughs> okay. and I'll have a better answer. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I don't have we will a, do that. I don't have a perfect answer for that question. Yeah. I mean, the kind of skills, 
kind of skills that you need um, if you're thinking about policy analysis in government, which are basically writing three-page, 14-point papers, mm -hmm. are very different than writing your 20-page term paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you might be able to prepare students for that effectively, but I'm not completely sure. Your second question, of course, drags us into the bowels of political mm -hmm. science and how do we think about area studies. Um, that's, this has been a long, ongoing tension in political science. Um, and people who did kind of conventional area studies, you know, certainly less validated now than they would have been 30 years ago. I have to say, from my time in government, that when you were reaching out and trying to think about your policy in a specific area, the people that were most valuable were people who knew the country in detail. Now, ideally, what you want are people that can, I mean, have both a kind of analytic arsenal of contemporary political science um, and also detailed and in-depth knowledge of specific places. And I think, actually, that's something that our colleagues in comparative politics would agree with. But um, it is true that the most valuable information often in government was what we would call area studies knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out, I mean, what you should do, pick your difficult spot. What you really want to know is, you know, how do I really understand this country? And in some cases, if you're looking at things that are more short term, how do I understand the motivations of this or that political leader? Uh, which leads me to my final question as you reflect on your experience. Uh, how important, you know, in, in international relations, we, we sort of look at, you know, the, the domestic situation, we look at the structure of the system, and then, you know, in history, people have looked in personality. How does that all come together for you? Were, 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 were personalities really important in this recent period in the making of U.S. foreign policy? Yeah. I mean, I would say yes, but here is, I mean, I would start with the broader parameters first. You know, power absolutely matters. Um, if you took the same personalities, say, in the American government and you would plop them down, let's leave Liechtenstein aside and <laughs> go to a bigger place like Luxembourg, um, you know, obviously it wouldn't have mattered because mm -hmm. you didn't have the power to act. To act. Um, I do think if you're looking at foreign policy, at least in initial choices, that the decisions that are made by, by individuals really are extremely consequential. Um, you know, I think any American leader after 9-11 would have gone into Afghanistan. You know, I think many would have gone into Iraq, but not necessarily all. Um, the way you thought about what the challenge would be um, certainly would have varied depending on who was in office. So I think that personalities and belief systems are, are really important, especially in these environments where the structural constraints are actually quite broad. Um, so that there are many different choices that you could make to deal with the challenges that you're confronting. Mm -hmm. And we're not very good at analyzing personalities. We don't have a good way of addressing that. Steve, on that note, I want to thank you uh, very much for being here. And I want to say, yes, we want you to come back after you've taught this course. And, and then you can give us a definitive answer on that one question. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.